Hello everyone and welcome to Mighty Vids 1 True Crime. If you're new to this channel and you like this video, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Today we are going to look into the story of former heavyweight boxing champion Sonny Liston and the controversy surrounding his death. We are going to look into the people he was connected to and the things that didn't add up with his body and the death scene. And you can decide, was Sonny Liston murdered? Charles Sonny Liston was born in Arkansas and his exact date of birth was never known, but he was thought to be born in 1930. He was born into a poor, sharecropping family on a plantation. Since birth certificates didn't become mandatory in Arkansas until 1965, the 1930s and 40s, there was no record of a Charles or even Sonny Liston, so maybe even Sonny himself didn't know exactly how old he was. Liston always gave his official date of birth as May 8th, 1932, but his mother stated he was born 1930, so the most accurate year he was born was indeed 1930. His father told Liston was a strict disciplinarian and would whip Sonny so bad he had scars which was visible over 10 years later. I guess this made Sonny the man and fighter he was, tough, fearless and the most intimidating fighter to walk this earth. As Sonny Liston himself quoted, that the only thing that man gave me was a beating. In 1946, Sonny's mother Ellen went to St. Louis to look for factory work and took along his other siblings, while Sonny stayed in Arkansas with his father. According to Sonny, he was aged around 13 and desperately wanted to live with his mother and other siblings. He smashed down the pecans from his brother-in-law's tree and sold them, and with the money, he made his way to St. Louis to see his mother. While there, he tried to get educated at school, but to no avail, he would struggle and get fun made of him because of his illiteracy. Sonny also found it hard to find work while there, and this was where he turned to crime. It wasn't long before he got his gang together and led the gang of thugs to commit muggings and armed robberies. He would wear the same shirt in the robberies and become known to the police as the Yellow Shirt Bandit. Then in 1950, Sonny was caught for his crimes and gave his age as 20 when he was most likely at the age of 22. Sonny Liston was sentenced to five years in the Missouri State Penitentiary on June 1st, 1950. He got on with his prison and never complained about doing time, stating that he was always guaranteed three meals a day. While there, he met Reverend Alois Stevens, who was over the athletic department in the prison, who suggested that Sonny take up boxing. And if he kept to it and kept himself to himself and kept out of trouble, Stevens would recommend an early parole. Reverend Stevens set a sparring match with a professional heavyweight boxer called Furman Wilson, and this would show what Sonny was all about and the tools he possessed as a fighter. Wilson only lasted two rounds with Sonny, stating that he better get him out of there, Sonny was going to kill him. This was the start of the boxer Sonny Liston, and now he knew his true potential. Sonny Liston was released from prison in October 1952. He had an amateur career that didn't even last a year. He did, however, win the Chicago Golden Gloves tournament, even beating Olympic heavyweight champion Ed Sanders. He also competed for the US National Championships, but was defeated by a 17-year-old Jimmy McCarter in the quarterfinals. He would later go on to Ian McCarter as his sparring partner. He did carry on a little further in the amateurs after this in a competition of USA versus West Europe. In 1953, he was knocked out by a West German fighter in the first round. Although he had lost in several competitions, the coach had said he was one of the strongest fighters he had ever had. It was around this time that Sonny Liston had became involved with organised crime and mobsters. Sonny Liston turned professional in September 1953 claiming whatever you tell me to do, I will do it. He was coached and managed by a team who was with heavy ties to John Vitale, a big St. Louis underworld figure. It was only these type of underworld figures willing to back Sonny and put up the money for him to go professional and to fight. Sonny made his money early on being an enforcer and intimidator for crime bosses. This worked good for Sonny in the beginning as it got his career started, but later it would come back to haunt him. He had his first professional fight in September 1953 in St. Louis, knocking out Don Smith in the first round. He had his next five fights in St. Louis where people quickly began to recognise he was a force to be reckoned with. 
It was his sixth bout he really made his mark in Detroit against a ranked fighter named Johnny Summerlin. This fight was on national television, which Sonny won on an eighth round points decision, and the same result in the rematch, and both in Summerlin's own town of Detroit. Sonny lost his eighth bout to journeyman Marty Marshall, who broke Sonny's jaw in the third round while Sonny was laughing. Sonny still carried on and took it to the eighth round and lost on points. He did, however, beat Marshall in the rematch, knocking him out in the sixth round in 1955. Then in May 1956, a police officer stopped listening in the street and all hell broke loose after Sonny said he used racial slurs. Sonny beat up the officer, gashing his knee and face and taking his gun. The story hit the media after Sonny's arrest and police had broke nightsticks over his skull but still didn't take Sonny down. He was now perceived as the fighter Sonny Liston, who was known as which was a scary-ass monster who was impervious to pain. He was sentenced to nine months in prison and paroled after serving six months. Now with the police in St. Louis out to get him every chance they got and knowing his life was in danger from the police, he left St. Louis. It was now 1958 and Sonny Liston won eight fights that year, six of them by knockout. He also now had a new manager, Joseph Pet Baroni. He was a front man for the mob bosses Frankie Carbo and Frankie Blinky Palmero. Then in 1959, Sonny made a bigger name and climbed higher in the ranks by knocking out contender Mike Tajon in six rounds. He fought Cleveland Williams, a big fish in the boxing world, who was also billed as the hardest hitting heavyweight. The odds were stacked against Sonny as Williams was meant to be the next big thing in boxing, but Sonny stopped him in the third round and this victory was regarded by some to be Liston's most impressive performance. Sonny had five more big fights climbing his way to the top, winning four by knockout, becoming the number one contender and mandatory fighter for the heavyweight champion Floyd Patterson. Now, even despite Sonny Liston being the number one contender for the heavyweight title, the handlers of the champion Floyd Patterson was to refuse Liston a title shot because of Liston's links to organised crime. This was mainly opposed by Patterson's manager Custom Otto. Sonny Liston did not help the matter by carrying on with his criminal activity, being arrested several times in the process. Sonny had his licence suspended in all states in 1961. Civic leaders and other public figures didn't want Liston to have a chance at being champion, worried that his bad character would hurt civil rights movements and also that Liston would set a bad example for the youth. Even President John Kennedy didn't want Patterson to fight Liston, stating the US Justice Department had concerns over Liston's ties to organised crime. Sonny Liston changed his management and pulled a media stunt stating that Floyd Patterson only fought mostly white fighters and was going against his own race by not giving a coloured fighter a chance. Floyd Patterson finally gave up and agreed to fight Sonny Liston for the title and the fight took place in Chicago on September 25th, 1962. Once again, Liston was the underdog with experts and critics stating Liston didn't take what it had against a skilled, quick fighter like Patterson. Many former heavyweight champions picked Patterson to win, including Rocky Marciano, but one fighter bat Liston, a rising contender at the time called Cassius Clay, who later became Muhammad Ali, predicted Liston to knock out Patterson within five rounds and he was right. The fight was a complete mismatch for Liston who knocked out Patterson at two minutes six in the first round and it was the third fastest knockout in heavyweight history. Sonny Liston was now champion and forever known for being the most intimidating fighter to walk this planet. His luck was enough to put the fear into the hardest of fighters. Fighters like George Foreman who was a sparring partner for Sonny Liston adapted this persona in his career and also Mike Tyson, but no one was naturally as intimidating as Sonny Liston. In July 1963, Liston had a rematch with former champion Floyd Patterson, and the result of the fight was the same outcome, with only four seconds apart. Floyd Patterson was knocked out in the first round at 2 minutes 10. Liston knocked down Patterson three times in this fight also. It seems Sonny Liston was invincible. It was now February 25th, 1964, and Liston was up against Cassius Clay, who later became Muhammad Ali. Clay was the opposite of Liston. Unlike Liston's quiet, intimidating persona, Clay was loud and outspoken and took entertainment to the boxing world mainstream. Clay quoted, If you want to lose your money, then bet on Sonny, and taunted Liston from the onset. 
Sonny Liston went into this fight the favourite and was confident on beating Clay. With Clay's fast footwork and quick fighting style compared to a hard hit in Liston, Clay took advantage of the fight from the onset. Even switching to quick defence, quick offence later on, Liston did give a good fight, if not an even fight, and the judges awarding him several rounds in the fight. Then, as Clay went into his corner at the end of round four, he could not see as something had clearly gone into his eyes and temporarily blinded him. There was protests from the ringside, with even some blaming Clay's cornerman, Angelo Dundee. Despite the blindness, Clay went in round five and kept Sonny Liston at bay, so whatever he had in his eyes faded out. Liston failed to come out of his corner after the bell for round seven, and Clay won by a technical knockout. Sonny Liston apparently quit because of a reoccurring shoulder injury, but the fight was scored uneven up until this point. It was now the Ali Liston rematch, and it was this fight that caused the stir up of a fixed fight from Sonny Liston. The fight was originally supposed to take place in Boston, but as the fight got close, the promoters got worried that the fight was either linked to organised crime with Boston mobsters. The fight took place in Lewiston, Maine, and to a complete shock of the world, Liston went down in the first round from a right punch. That missed Liston, and even if it did manage to hit him, it would have been a glancing blow and not had enough power to knock Liston down and it, like it did. Some at ringside said the punch did connect, but the majority saw what was known as the phantom punch. With no fault of Ali's, it seemed Liston took a dive for mob bosses, and this fight went down as probably the most controversial fight in boxing history. What do you think of the punch? Do you think it was a phantom punch, or do you think Ali connected with a blow? Let me know in the comments below. Sonny Liston carried on boxing until 1970, having 16 fights and only losing one of them, but after Ali, he never got close to a world title again. Liston carried on with life outside of boxing with his wife Geraldine, who he had married in 1957. His wife had a daughter from a previous marriage. Sonny and his wife also adopted a boy from Sweden. Sonny also kept close ties with mobsters after his boxing career. Sonny Liston's body was found by his wife Geraldine at their home in Las Vegas. His wife had been on a two-week trip, and when she returned, she smelled a really foul odour coming from the main bedroom. As she entered the room, Sonny was slumped up against the bed with a broken foot bench on the floor. Geraldine didn't call the police straight away, but called Sonny's lawyer, and the police wasn't notified till two to three hours later. At the beginning, the police thought he fell backwards with such force he broke the rail of the bench. Later, as police investigated Sonny's death, they thought there was no signs of foul play, but the cause of death was an heroin overdose. Apparently, according to police and several other people, they knew for a while Sonny was an heroin addict. Strangely, his exact date of death was not known, just like his exact date of birth, but the police put the dates together as December 30th, 1970, as this was added by the newspapers and milk bottles in the property. The coroner found that there was traces of heroin in Sonny's system, but not enough to kill him. There was a mark on the bend of Sonny's elbow, which looked like a needle mark, which was odd, as we will go into soon. Sonny died from congestion and heart failure, which was his official cause of death. Sonny had been suffering from hardening of the heart muscle and lung disease, but his body was too to decomposed to make the test conclusive. Sergeant Dennis Caputo was the first officer on the scene. He found a quarter ounce of heroin in a balloon in the kitchen and half ounce of weed in Sonny's pants pocket. The strange thing was Sergeant Caputo, no other police officer, failed to find any drug paraphernalia. No syringe, nothing. How could Sonny have died from an overdose and get rid of the needle and other paraphernalia like a spoon to cook up the drugs? Nothing was present close by to tie around his arm. Police dismissed that theory, stating that it was common for family members to get rid of things and tidy up in such cases to save the family embarrassment, especially a famous figure like Sonny. Another strange thing in this case was that Sonny was petrified of needles, and that was well-known fact between everyone that knew him. Sonny's past trainer had stated that Sonny had turned down fights in certain countries because he needed vaccinations, which he refused Geraldine, Sonny's wife, also said that Sonny had turned down holidays and time away in certain places because of this fear. 
Sonny had been to the hospital a couple of weeks earlier suffering from whiplash from a minor car accident which he had an injection and this could have been the needle bark mark on his elbow found after his death. Sonny had complained about having to have the needle and felt hard done by for weeks afterwards. Many people have claimed Sonny Liston was murdered. There were several theories and reasons why. Some who knew Liston believed he was deeply involved as a debt collector and a debt collecting loan sharking ring and Sonny had tried to muscle his way in for a bigger share. Publicist Arrow Conrad thinks his employers got him drunk, took him home and injected him with the drugs. Another source who knew Sonny insisted he was murdered by drug dealers who he had been involved with. The source, who was a professional gambler, said he was told by police that Sonny Liston had been seen at an house that was a target for a drug bust. And the police have told him to tell Sonny to stay away from the house, but the gambler later learned that the police had told Sonny the same. Sonny was present at a drug dealer's house, he was called Earl Cage, and because of the tip-offs by the police, and Sonny being there at the time of the raid, Cage may have thought Liston was a police informer and injected him with the hot dolls. <clears throat> Another theory was that the mob promised to pay Liston a large amount of money to throw the Ali fight and never gave him the cash, and as years went on, Sonny needed the money, more and more suffering more financially. He got angry at the Mafia and threatened to go public if they didn't pay. Apparently, Liston was paid to take a dive against his last opponent, Chuck Webner, in June 1970. But obviously, didn't as Sonny won in the ninth round, and the mob had, had had enough and decided to murder Liston. Sonny Liston's wife, Geraldine, had called Johnny Tocco. He was a legendary trainer and gym owner, as she had not heard from him for three days and was really worried. Several years before Johnny Tocco died, he told the story to one of his friends, Tony Davy. Tocco's story was that he had gone to Liston's house and found the door locked and the car still parked in the driveway. He called the police who broke into the house and checked on Liston. He said the house and the furniture was a mess but said that the house didn't smell. As they entered the bedroom they found Liston on the bed with a needle in his arm. Tocco left before the police did. His friend Tony Davy said that Tocco was not a blackguard and told Davy in the strictest confidence because he was his best friend and he just wanted to get it off his chest. Apparently a lot of police officers had entered Sonny's house and knew he was dead way before his wife had come home, but they chose to keep it quiet from letting him rot for some odd reason. I guess we will never know what happened to Sonny Liston, but his death definitely was suspicious. Something was definitely covered up somewhere, maybe by his wife or the police. Maybe he was murdered and he had a lot of enemies, but why inject him in his own house with a hot shot of heroin? Most people in Vegas with mob trouble just go to the desert to be buried and are never seen again. Sonny had a lot of demons and was known to be an heavy drinker at times, even leading up to the Ali fight. People have their own stories and versions of events, but which one is true? I guess we will never know. All that can be said. Of Sonny Liston was a legendary fighter and earned his respect to the ring. He is rightly so an Hall of Famer and a hero and a fighting role model for many former champions, including Mike Tyson. Rest in peace, Sonny Liston. Thanks for watching, Mike, if it's one true crime. What do you think happened to Sonny Liston? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you.